Greetings. Good evening. Well, I, I'm glad to be here. I, I love to be in the house of the Lord. I want to share with you this evening the testimony of Econet. But I'm only going to give you a little bit. Because there just isn't enough time. Many of you have probably read about us or heard about us. Econet, first and foremost, is a Christian company. And I'm going to share with you how the Lord has used us to raise up the testimony through this company. We have a presence today in ten countries, including South Africa, where we have a head office. We have gone from Zimbabwe to Botswana to Lesotho to Kenya, Burundi, Nigeria, the United Kingdom, New Zealand. I have even addressed the cabinet of Papua New Guinea. We have been invited, we are in Fiji, negotiating a license there. We have gone to the uttermost parts of the earth. But how have we been able to do it? I'm going to try and give you a chronological background with testimony. Many of you probably heard about the long legal battle that Econet fought in Zimbabwe for its first license. It came when I was a baby Christian. You must not be a baby Christian all your life. But sadly some people remain baby Christians all their lives. I remember going to see a very senior advocate in Zimbabwe after the government had turned down our application for a license. And somebody had drawn my attention to a provision in the Constitution under what is called the freedom of expression. Every man has the right to receive and impart information without hindrance. It was a little clause in the Constitution. And I went to see the senior advocate he read it, and he said to me, Yes, I think you would win. But I think it would be easier for you to go and steal a tank and drive it into the center of the, of the city. Because the reaction of the government to what you're thinking of doing is going to be the reaction they would have if somebody stole a tank and drove it into Unity Square. I thanked him. I had been saved not a couple of months earlier than that. And encouraged by a lawyer I was consulting in the United States who didn't understand these things, we prepared our papers to file a constitutional challenge to the right of the government to own, to be the only ones who operate a telephone company. When the papers were ready, I sat on them for about six months until the year came to an end and still the lawyers were waiting for an instruction from me to file them. One Sunday morning I went to church. I'm so glad I see my good friend Willie Ralph here. Uh, he was in that service that morning. Good to see you, Willie. I went to church that Sunday morning. 
And after the service, as I stood outside, a friend of mine's wife came up to me. And she said, what are you up to? She said, my husband never slept last night. The Lord kept waking him up and said, go tell Strive, do it. I said, he said that? She said, yes. I said, well, I did it on Friday. And I had filed the papers. To find out what happened, I think you should just visit our websites and the websites of all the newspapers that you can think of. It ended up even in the Parliament of Denmark. Um, The battle that came was a five-year legal battle. It was intense and I became persona non grata. I couldn't even be quoted. I once told Winnie Mandela, you weren't the only one who couldn't be quoted. For five years we went through this. But every day I had this tremendous grace, tremendous encouragement. Not only because of my faith, which was growing, but because of the army that the Lord raised around me of prayer partners in the church and throughout the world. You know, one, one morning, my mother called me, and she never calls me at work. And she said, somebody just called me on the phone. They're looking for you. And she said, it's a woman in the villages. She said she's been looking for you for a long time, and she has a word for you. I remember discussing it with some of my colleagues at the office. And one of the brothers turned around and said, if she has a word for you, let's go see her. I said, I'm not going to the villages for that. He says, I'll drive. (laughs) So we agreed. And we went there. First of all, we asked her about where she fellowshiped, which church she went to. And she said to us, she was from the Apostolic Faith Mission. Very educated young lady her husband was a teacher at a mission school and we prayed together with her and she had a prayer group and she said you know the Lord woke me up you're the man I saw in a dream and I didn't know about you until somebody mentioned when I mentioned it to you and she said well the Lord says you must fast for the next three days And she said, we are supposed to join you. We are your partners in this fast. I said, well, okay, that's uh, six to six. That's fine. She said, no, no, no. Three days, 36 hours, Esther. I said, that's fine. I used to be a diabetic. I was healed some time ago. At that time, I struggled with it. Because I'm not supposed to go 36 hours without eating. But the Lord gave us grace. And three days later, the lawyers called me. They said, you know, in fact it was quite interesting because we got to the church, to the offices, and the entire legal firm were in the corridors and it was a Jewish firm. And one, the Jewish partner, senior partner, met me and he said, I tell you, man, it is a miracle. (laughs) I said, you should know about those, eh? (laughs) And um, it was. It was a staggering miracle. There had been a tender over this license. The courts had ordered over and over and over again. And each time the government had said no. And so they had run a tender. And they had decided who the winner was. But they then handed us the documents where they made the decision. And those documents had been with us all along. And as we opened the documents, there was the entire decision. 
In fact, we filed, I went to the newspaper and the editor said to me, you know I'm not supposed to even talk to you. It was a government newspaper. So I gave him the papers, he looked at this and he said, you know this will cost me my job if I so much as write about it. I said, I just wanted you to know. And the following day it was the front page. He got fired. The Lord blessed him. He now lives in Switzerland. (laughs) And the government decided it was time to give us a license. They called me, the minister called me in and he said, look, we've decided to give you the license. I said, thanks, but no thanks. And he said, but you can have the license. I said, if I take the license from you, you will say you licensed me. I want the court to rule. So we waited the next six months. And one day I had to, I went to um, Boston. And whilst I was in Boston, I had a dream. And the judge was ruling. He was reading a ruling. I woke up. I called one of my colleagues in Harare. I said, has the ruling been issued? He said, no. I said, now, there's a sort of eight, nine hour time difference. I said, check with our lawyers. And he rushed off to the lawyers and they said, today's a public holiday. Judges don't rule today. I went back to bed. Two hours later, he called me. He said, the lawyer just called. The judge has been promoted and he wants to rule today because tomorrow he's a judge of the Supreme Court. And so, Econet was established in Zimbabwe. Today, it is Zimbabwe's largest company by market capitalization. It controls banks, it controls insurance companies. Econet is the largest single taxpayer in Zimbabwe. The Lord says, I'll lay a table for you in the midst of your enemies. We have a very good relationship with the government today. We don't have a problem. Then a brother came to see me one morning. And he said to me, The Lord has spoken to me concerning Econet in Botswana. And he wants you to go there. I said, I've never even been to Botswana. He said, well, I told, I made the mistake, I guess. I told my wife. She said, you better go. (laughs) In fact, she was so insistent, she bought the tickets. And I went to Gaborone for the first time. And um, I went over to the regulator's office. And I walked into the wrong office. And there was a man sitting there and he looked at me. He said, you're the little man from Zimbabwe (laughs) who caused Mugabe all those troubles. I said, yes. He said, you're too late if you are here for the Botswana license. It closes in two weeks' time. He says, anyway, since you've come all this way, I'll give you a set of the documents. That was a big mistake. I went back to the hotel. I put the documents on the floor. I lay on them and I prayed and I said, Lord, do something. You brought me here. The rest of the story... We're the second largest company in Botswana today. Um, You've probably heard, if you've ever been to Botswana, you've probably heard of Mascom Wireless. Um, It's the only company that sort of recognizes me in any small way. It actually stands for Masiwa Communications. But you know, we beat Vodacom in the auction for that license. 
we beat MTN. And I won't mention whose name it was, but one of them flew to Botswana and saw the vice president of Botswana, who's Botswana's current president. And he said, how can you give a license to a company with no operation anywhere in the world? Do you know who we are? How can you tell us this? And President Festus Mohai said, yes, before you came, I asked for a report. As you know, we brought in consultants from Sweden. And I don't know anything about this. But their report says that they won by 45%. So how am I supposed to overturn that? And so we, we thank the people of Botswana for their honesty and integrity. And so in December 1999, as the year came to a close, The Lord moved in my spirit that I had to fast for 40 days because he had something to say to me. And so I fasted. And the fast was to end on the last day of 1999. And I got a word. And it was an awesome word. And what was interesting about that word is a few weeks later I flew to New York. And um, I, I remembered to call Bishop Garlington. Some of you might know Bishop Garlington. And I called Bishop Garlington. He says, oh, Strive, I have been looking for you. I have a word for you. And you know what the word was. The Lord had given us Psalm 2 verse 8. Ask of me, and I'll give you the nations for an inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for a possession. You know, many people have often asked me, you've seen so many things. The Lord does these amazing things in your life. Why you? We don't see some of these things. And I said, and I'll tell you now why. Just after I was saved, I had an amazing hunger for the Lord. I bought a Bible and read it in two weeks flat. From Genesis to Revelations. I read it. I went looking for everything I could find. And amongst the things I I found was an interview of Catherine Kuhlman. Being interviewed by Oral Roberts. And he asked her the same question. And her answer is the answer I'll give you tonight. I was prepared to pay the price. That's what she said. And when I heard that, I got on my knees and I said, Lord, I'll pay the price. And the Lord showed me in a dream one night, I was walking with a child. And we were singing. We were singing a, a, a praise song in my Mother tongue, Shona. And it says, there is power. Power in the word of God. So remember that. As we received that word, I understood almost immediately that I had to leave Zimbabwe. It was not yet in crisis that it is in today. I have not been to Harare for seven and a half years. Because the Lord told me, You return when I tell you to return. We relocated to South Africa. We set up an office. We had no money. And as a Christian, I wasn't prepared to do anything. Even though we had a successful company, 
I wasn't going to break the exchange regulations. I went over to ESCOM and met some of their managers. I said, you're a power utility. They said, yes. I said, do you know you're also a telephone company? I said, really? I said, yes, you're the second largest telephone company in South Africa. And I showed them how it was so through their infrastructure. And I said, you know, why don't we get into business? Since you have all this telephone capability, which you don't know about, I can help you make some money. And they said, okay, show us. So they gave me a team, and we bid for Telcom Lesotho, the government telephone company. And we won the bid. And uh, in terms of our understanding, I could put a team to run the company, which we did. And when the time came, the Lord said to, to them, you sell, them to, you sell your shares to us. And we said, that's fine. We always knew that's the way it would work. And so we were established in Lesotho. Then I got a phone call from a group of Maoris in New Zealand. And they said, come and work with us. And I remembered, you see, the word said, ask of me. And I'll give you the nations for an inheritance. And that was, I'll give you Africa for an inheritance. And the uttermost parts of the earth for a possession. I said, I'm on my way. Now, I went the wrong way. I didn't know that you were supposed to go east. I went to London. Then I flew to L.A. Then I flew to Sydney. And I arrived in Auckland 37 hours later. And as I arrived in Auckland, the guy who collected me from the airport said, Would you like to see Auckland? I said, Yes, of course. He said, There's a place called One Tree Hill. You can see the whole city and the Pacific Ocean from there. So I said, Fine. So we went and sure, it was One Tree Hill. There was a tree there and there was a hill. We climbed up to the top of the hill. As we went up the top of the hill, I saw two old men exercising. And this must have been seven o'clock in the morning. And as I stood looking at the hill, one of them called out and said, Hey, you, black man from Africa, who's Jesus Christ? I said, He's Lord. He said, Don't you forget about it. Welcome to New Zealand. I, we, we looked. As we went down the hill, they were not there. They had gone. So the New Zealand government called a public tender to auction a new cell phone license. And all the ugly sisters of the telecom world came. <laughs> Vodafone. Orange. Telstra, Hutchinson, Wampoa, and Econet. The pretty one. <laughs> and we filed, and we filed our bid. And they, they decided to issue a number of licenses. I think they issued about three. Us and the Maoris, and we bid, I think it came to something like six million dollars. And we were given our free, what we call the frequency band. And we had one month to pay. Now we bid, and we didn't have the money. But we knew who our provider was, and there was no presumption. We had prayed, we had prayed, and the Lord had said, go ahead. But still you're challenged. And we were running around in the banking system of the world in search of six million dollars. And would we get it? Came to the very last day. Now they're 12 hours ahead of us. 
So we are kind of about this time. And my wife and I are, my wife is there to see, uh, we'll get up and greet you all. And we were sitting. You know, somebody once asked me in Zimbabwe, they said, you know, in all those five years, did you ever think of quitting? I said, yes, once. So what happened? I said, my wife said she wanted to quit. <laughs> and so how, what happened then? I said, she decided she wasn't going to quit, so I decided I wasn't going to quit. You cannot do these things alone. My, we, we got to about 10 o'clock at night. And I said to Titi, We're not, there's nothing we can do now, I'm going to bed. She said, no, I'll stay up and I'll pray through the night. So I called my colleague in New Zealand, I said, look, we've not been able, we had secured the money, but we had not been able to move it across. I said, it's too late. I think, I have an idea, why don't you go to the government and ask them for an extension? He said, it's a public government tender. You can't ask for an extension. It's payment by 5 o'clock today because he was in New Zealand. I said, nothing I can do. He said, okay, I'll fly to Wellington and I will make the appeal. So when I woke up, and I always sleep because I'm a child of God. It doesn't matter what the circumstances uh, I have been told of amazing things that have happened on airplanes, and I was the one sleeping. <laughs> so I got up at 7 o'clock in the morning, fully rested. Tzitzi was at the edge of the bed. She had just finished praying. I said, well, did Tex call to say if the New Zealand government had agreed? He said, no. He didn't call. I said, but the money's not going to get there. So I called the guy. It's Friday evening, and he said, you know what, Strive? I paid. I said, you what? He said, I paid. I said, how did you pay? He said, you see, I got there. And there was Vodafone, and there was Telstra and Orange paying for their licenses. And I knew I'd never get any room. So I took my checkbook out, and I signed a check, and I gave them. <laughs> you see... See, and I concluded that since it's Friday and this money is really on its way, you have Saturday and Sunday to get it to me. And they won't deposit the check by Monday. I said, you've, you've ruined me. I mean, I flew out of the bed. I, I, you know, I just didn't even shower. I went to the office to work to get this money through. Monday morning it wasn't there. It wasn't there a week later. It, it, the wire transfer disappeared. We're trying to get it transferred into his account. Now if you've ever dealt with wire transfers, they disappear in the system. Banks do this so that they can earn the interest on the money. Three weeks later, we still hadn't found that transfer. We finally found it. Money hit his account. Two days later, they presented the check. Some guy put it in his drawer and went on holiday for three weeks. So the Lord said, now you go to Nigeria. I said, Lord, I'm not going there. I've heard about that place. And the Lord said, you're going to Nigeria. So we went. And um, I decided I really needed some big partners. They were going through an auction process. So we talked to Transnet. I hope there are people here from Transnet. We talked to Transnet. They said, yeah, we'll be your partners. Said, we'll put in $100 million. We were going into the auction. And the reserve price was $100 million. You had to bid 100 to get your $20 million deposit back. 
And together, twenty million dollars. Um, I get to Nigeria, and we. One of the guys says to me, "You know, there's a Christian sister who owns a bank, and she's asked you if you'd go to service to her church today with her and her husband. We're running around the banking system. They told me it's a small bank." So she's a Christian. I said, yes. And she said, I said, okay, I'll go to service with her. And we'll go to the service and we pray. And as we're going back, she says, Brother Strive, I'm so excited. I'm the one who's been used to give you the $20 million. And she says, I got together with some Christian brothers and we've put you the money. So now I had to save it with a reserve bid of 100 And I was busy looking for the 100 and so Transnet says, Transnet says, look, we're good for a hundred. So the bids have been set. The dates have been set. And we're off to Nigeria. And I've got a hundred million dollars in my pocket. And I'm hoping the bids will, will close at about that level. <laughs> Plus 20. As we were heading to the airport, The banker who had organized it all called me and he said, Strive, I think you better call off the trip. Strassnet board met today. And they said because they're also shelled as an MTN which is bidding. They can't be seen to back you. They've withdrawn the hundred. In fact, they're about to issue a statement on it. So I said, okay. He said, so what do we do? I said, we go to Nigeria. He said, we don't have the money. I said, well, let me, I'll tell you a story on the plane. So he comes in, and he's not a believer. He comes in, and he sits next to me. He says, what's the story? I told him about Gideon. I said, you see, we don't need them. And the guy says, listen, uh, we have a serious problem, and you're telling me about some <laughs> old Jewish story. I said, yeah. You see, for God's glory to come through, they had to go. He says, well, God better pitch up pretty quickly because this auction is in two days. So we, we, we go to, to Lagos. At night, and the Lord doesn't always and come that- to me in dreams. And it's always important, whatever I say about, you say about a dream, you must anchor yourself in the word. But I think the Lord needed to encourage me in the same way he encouraged Gideon that night. And it was quite extraordinary. And some of you are going to find this pretty hard. I had a dream that I was in a boardroom. And on the board were the names of the bidders. And there were five of them. We all knew who the bidders were. And by the way, the Nigerian press was having a field day about us. And on the table, on the board, were numbers, which I immediately recognized. And I told a companion to write them down. And they were the numbers of all the various bids that would go in. And so... We went to the auction and we didn't, we had commitments, but we didn't have the money. And we battled, we had, and I said, we're going into the auction. And it was a three day auction, and we're each of us locked in a room. We had a team, I had a team of, we were five of us international bankers and lawyers and everybody there. MTN was in another room. Um, others that maybe many of you do not know, perhaps. There were five bidders. We got past the hundred on the first day, so at least the twenty million was saved. We could drop out. And the guys were saying, look, we've saved the twenty. Now let's drop out. I said, no, that's okay. Let's just wait and see how far we get. When we hit $165 million on the bids, 
I got up and I said, the first bidder is about to exit. And the auctioneer walked in and said, we just lost the bidder. You are now four of you. We went a few more bids, and I said, the next bidder will exit at the next one. So the next one bid collapsed. And I had the... the so they said, where did you get those numbers? I said, the Lord told me. Now you... You can imagine how difficult it was for these people. And I said, have any of you ever prayed? So now I was ministering to them. I got them into a circle. Now they totally believed. (laughs) And they said, so when will the auction end? I said, three or four bids time. And I called them over, and when we got to the last bid, I said, gentlemen, the auction is about to end now. I just need to thank the Lord. And we all got into a circle, and I prayed with them. And the auctioneer walked in and handed us the provisional license. $285 million. And nine days later, we paid. We had two weeks. Of course, many of you know about the battles that have taken place in Nigeria, and I'm not going to go into that. As I said, we could write a lot about this, and books would be filled. Last year, we were given exactly 30 days to raise 1.5 billion U.S. dollars. It was all raised. On time. And as the Lord told us, it would be raised. Our mission is a simple mission. And I was so excited, Pastor, when you you put up the slides. Because it really ministered to me. Our mission is to give glory to God. So Richard Branson called me and offered to buy one of our businesses. And he put a very exciting proposal to me. It was very good for the kids, you know. And because when I walked back in and said, Who are you talking to? I said, Richard Branson. And they all said, Really? I said, Yes. And I was telling him about the Lord. (laughs) See, he put the proposal to me and I said to him, Sir Richard. So he kept saying, call me Richard. I said, Sir Richard. I can only sleep in one bed at night and I drive one car. And I still haven't figured out how to to sleep in two beds at the same time, let alone drive two cars. But he says, how can you be so sure that this isn't what you're supposed to do? I mean, this is a great opportunity. I said to him, you know what? I would rather be wrong, lose, believing God was with me than to win knowing he wasn't. You know when God is not with you. It's about stewardship. I want to encourage you to think about that. Many brethren in... um, in Zimbabwe prayed for Econet's license. Wasn't our prayers alone. Today, Econet funds in Zimbabwe the school fees of 26,000 orphans. It's one of the largest programs of its kind. I remember sitting with the chief executive of one of South Africa's largest banks at dinner one night. And he said to me, what percentage of your turnover? I mean, this is a huge cost. 
and it's a public company. What percentage of your turnover is this? So I told him. He said, I can't believe it. That's my entire margin. I said, and you know what? Ever since we did it, we became more profitable. We are interested in God's mission. It is not, I have no doubt in my life that Econet will be one of the biggest telecommunications companies in the world. Because God said so. And that settles it. However, it is not because we will be the biggest company in the world. When I, want, when I walk into heaven, I look to seeing the people whose lives we, we touched. Because we, we printed, we paid for the printing of Bibles. Because we, we paid for churches. We paid for conferences. Because we helped evangelists move around the world. Which is what we do today. Because when we heard the cry of orphans, we were there. We have a program that sends the children of pastor's widows to school. Today we, we're working on a program to distribute, to send disabled young girls to school. The most vulnerable of the most vulnerable. When people don't have money, and they have two sons and a daughter, and one is blind, and the daughter is blind. Do you think they'll send her to school? No, they won't. Not because they are mean, but because those are the hard decisions that people are making out there in the community, in this place where we live. And God is using, is raising us up as businessmen. As stewards, as conduit. The Bible says that don't muzzle the ox that treads the corn. See yourself as that ox. You'll be allowed to eat as much as you want. God is not saying you can't have the Porsche and the Mercedes and the big house. But don't lose sight of the mission. It's about stewardship. I have many opportunities people who come to me and say they want to be in partnership with us. But you know what? I can't be in partnership with them if it will result in them affecting a decision which I might make for the kingdom. You know, one day there was a big boat race going around the world. And a big international company called me and said to me, Will you join us in sponsoring this? I said, what do I get? He says, well, one of the boats will have Econet written on the side of it. I said, how much will it cost? He said, well, this, to sponsor the boats, 40 million US dollars. We all get our name on it. I said, 40 million US dollars. He says, very good. Don't you know the TV coverage you'll get? And the Holy Spirit said to me, you see, this is how the world uses its resources. What are you doing with yours? I called our managers, I said, listen, if a church walks in here and says they want a conference paid for, you pay for it. I said, in fact, go out and look for them and tell them that you will pay for their conferences. If they want an international speaker to come in and we've got the money, you pay for it. And if anybody asks you, tell them to come and see me. It is about our stewardship. But you see, when we, when we are faced with this, we, 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 we come back and we say, no, no, you know, this is not right. You know, we can't be seen to do this. We cannot separate 
our value systems, our, our spirituality, for want of another word, from our work. Our work is our ministry. The place you... Now, you know, that's not to say we insist that only Christians can work for us. No, that's not true. In fact, it would be a great tragedy. Can you eat a meal that is just salt? Salt requires something to be salted. So, we want you to be there. And we will never preach to you. But you know, I'll close with this. When we raised the 1.5 billion last year for a transaction, they refused to sell. And we, were, we got into another major battle. And we were bitterly... It was hard. Even for the most seasoned veterans in our Christian camp. And one day, I was sitting in my office, and a young man who works for us never thought of him as a believer, and I knew he wasn't a believer, walked into my office and he says, Try, how do you feel? I said, it is well. I said, do you know where that comes from? He said, tell me about it. So I told him about the Shunammite woman whose son had died. And she rushed over to see the prophet Elisha. And of course she met his servant along the way. You all know the story. Her son was dead. And the servant said, how is it with you? How is it with your son? And she said, it is well. So I told him the story. And he looked at me and he said, that's not the part of that scripture I would have used. I said, really? He says, yes, the part of the scripture that applies to this particular situation is when she converses with the prophet. I said, so teach me now. He said, okay. You see, she says to the prophet, did I ask for the child? She says, you see, what she was telling the prophet is that you brought this child, you know, it's through you. Now it's broken, now you fix it. You see, the Lord just raised 1.5 billion, right? I said, yes. So let's just ask him to fix it. Just like the Shunammite woman. I looked at this guy and I said, Lord, that's more important than anything we could possibly have achieved. I've told you a testimony about the strength of God. Because the Bible says, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. We've gone up against Vodacom, MTN, all of them. And we always say, Lord, who can be weaker than us? Surely now is your strength made perfect. And so that is my message for you today. If you're a believer, I hope you have been encouraged. And if you're not, I hope you've been disturbed enough <laughs> to want to find out more. And if you have been, I leave you to Pastor James and City Life. Thank you very much. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Amen. 
You know, as、um, Strive was speaking, I saw a blank piece of paper in my mind's eye, and it it said just one word across the whole page. I said, "Lord, what are you saying to us?" And you know what it was? Obedience. This man has obeyed the Lord, and the Lord, and he's favoured God's righteous cause, and has said, "Lord, I'll do whatever it takes." I'll pay the price if I have to wait five years and battle the government single-handedly to do what I know you put in my heart to do. I'll do it, even though I'm nothing in my own flesh and my own ability. I know that with you, I'm the majority. And、um, wherever you may stand today, whatever's going on in your business, in your life, wherever you are, you may be small in yourself. But if you have tapped into the mind of God, your few fish and your few loaves of bread can do more in the hand of God than you can even think of right now. So take some advice from a, a short shona man here, and understand that God wants to do more than you. Are willing to see right now, no matter how old, no matter what your education. Now we're not talking about get rich quick. We're talking about tapping into the will of God, being willing to pay the price, and sticking with it through good times and bad times, and being a person of faith. This is what obedience is. And so this this evening, we're a church who believes in impartation. Can I hear an amen? You've heard some information tonight, but I believe the thing that is going to change your heart and change your life is impartation. And so, what I'd like to do tonight is I want to ask Brother Strive tonight to to pray over all of us tonight that there would be an impartation that even as the Lord spoke to him, he would speak to you to be faithful. With what the Lord has already put in your hand, Amen. Put your hand out like this, and say this with me: Jesus, show me what you have put in my hand. Today, I choose to be faithful and obey you. With this thing, in Jesus' name, 